Since founding NOAA's rule in 2004, our next speaker has worked with over 100 resource companies on financing and hedging. Would you please join me in welcoming the principal and founder of NOAA's rule, Sean Russo. Sean. Thanks. Thank you. Firstly, thanks very much to the organisers for the opportunity and uh, thanks everyone for, for turning up. Um, people who've seen me speak before will be familiar with that cartoon, but I always like to remind people that we see our mission at Noah's Rule of making sure our clients are more like cockroaches than dinosaurs. Dinosaurs roam the world for a while and then disappear overnight. Cockroaches can survive just about anything and we know that there are a lot more, cock a lot more than two cockroaches on the ark. So we want clients that really have a balance sheet that they can preserve and build over time and they want, to have, they want to have debt that they can repay and you as investors should want that as well and the management of mining companies should want that. Um, the title of this presentation, The New Normal, How Royalties and Innovative Debt and Equity Financing uh, Changing the Investment Landscape was one that I was given rather than one that I chose. When I told my colleagues that I had to speak about the new normal, could they put some slides together? This is the first slide that they gave me, it wasn't very helpful, but they're about the same age as me and equally cynical. And we do think in our place that it is really different this time. So yes, there are things about the debt uh, market that are changing the landscape, but they're not necessarily all innovative. Um, before I jump onto that, just a quick thing about why the hell is this guy who's normally rabbiting on about hedging someone I should listen to about debt? Well, at Noah's Rule, we actually are debt guys and girls. Um, we, we've worked on a lot. We've worked on $2 billion of project financing. Uh, we have a very strong pedigree coming from Rothschild and other places. Um, we've always taken a very public position on hedging because 98% of the commentary in the market on hedging was bullshit and we thought someone needed to speak up in favour of a more balanced argument, create a better environment for those people who do want to manage their companies properly and hedging's part of that. And I think we've seen that in the Australian landscape. We also think that hedging and debt are necessary bedfellows, which is not a view that's shared by necessarily everyone. Um, we don't advertise our debt advisory services because we tend to chase the companies that we want to work with and we think the survivability of our clients um, speaks for themselves as to both our selection process and the quality of our clients. So in that context, what I'd like to do today in discussion is to tell you that we have pulled apart every possible alternative type of financing offered to any of our clients. We've seen royalties, we've seen streaming, we've seen convertible debt, we've seen everything. Um, and I have to say that in most cases our clients have taken vanilla debt and a little bit of hedging. We have done um, a royalty, we did do a, a, a streaming slash royalty type deal for a North American client in, um, in Africa, but I have to say they were determined that's what they were gonna do from the outset, didn't matter what we told them. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So I want to give you a taste today for the differences between these things. Um, but what I want to do more than anything is you can't cover all this stuff in the time allowed. I could talk for hours on this subject. Um, I, what I want to do is give you a taste for how we try and get our clients to pick apart the differences and the alternatives. And I think it's the same as investors to look at a deal and understand what the motivations for doing that deal are. Because the motivations, the reasons for choosing between royalty and streaming or a royalty or, or um, raising equity or doing debt um, are very company specific and you want to understand and listen to the language as well of the companies when they tell you about that hedging as to why they, they did it. So there's a lot of information on these slides. Please don't try and read all the slides as I'm talking. You get totally confused but they're going to be on the website so you can go back as a resource to look at this. I'll try and hit, I'll try and hit the high points. Um, so the first thing is to say that there is absolutely nothing new under the sun, but there's no end of innovation and creative ways that people have come to try and lend money to those who wish to borrow, and all the different methods that people have used to procure money from those who might want to get a better yield on their money. And uh, at the same time, for all those years of innovation, I don't think mining has got any easier. So it's e never been easier to borrow money if you're a miner right than it is right now. It's never been easier to get debt. It's no easier repaying debt today than it was. It might be easier if the prices go up and the, either in, the, in the future are higher. The most important line on that slide is it's all about the CADS line. Cash available for debt service. Or if you have a royalty or a streaming thing, how much metal is left over after you sell enough metal to pay your bills. This is the most important thing in assessing mine finance. Now, there's lots of reasons that mines fail, but mining engineers are generally better than the guys that finance them. And I would say, if we did a study, we would find that costs exceeding, um, cost, costs exceeding the revenue received for metal brought to the surface would have killed more mines, that is negative 
of cash available for debt service, as opposed to mines that didn't just work like the engineers planned them. I have been involved in financing some mines that when they got to the bottom of the decline, the, the ore body was not where they thought it was. The financing was a success, the mine was a failure, but that's a bit different. So in the tent, in the, in, when we look at this in the context of the CADS line, just remember this. If you remember nothing else I say today, I'll say this about six times probably, but if you remember nothing else I say today, if A can lend you more than B, then B is assuming a higher production rate, a lower cost of production, or a higher achieved price in the future. And that can all be achieved with what I saw my banking colleagues do when I was at Rothschild, what I describe as spreadsheet arbitrage. If you want to make a mine successful so that you can finance it, you will find a way in the spreadsheet to do it. But it will not make it any easier for that mine in real life to repay. And if you find that the person who's lending you the money is accepting your version of events and the most bullish forecast you can find. And just remember Grouch, what Groucho Marx said about, you know, if I'm a member of a club, I wouldn't want to join. Anyone who would lend me that much money, I wouldn't want to borrow from. And I probably wouldn't want to be a shareholder of them either. Last week at a conference I spoke at, they, they had a big sort of video at the beginning of the day and they showed Shirley Bassey singing. And I just, I loved it, you know. They say the next big thing is here. I, I'm desperate to sing this, but I won't. I only do that when I'm in sequins and heels. That, that the revolution's near, but to me it seems quite clear that it's all just a little bit of history repeating. And I felt a little bit of history repeating last week. I thought I'd fallen asleep at one point. I thought I was, I was in a lithium presentation. I, I fell asleep. I thought I'd woken up in an iron ore presentation. But that's the wonderful thing about mining entrepreneurs. They never give up. Let me say at this point, I am a huge bull on commodities. If you saw me speak last week, you would know that. I think there are fortunes to be made. But the great thing is, and no disrespect to the people in the battery metals, I wish them the best of luck. But in the old world metals like lead and zinc and copper and gold and nickel, and I'm sorry if I missed any out there, God bless the battery guys. I really do wish them the best. But you say lithium and cobalt, and I think iron ore and uranium. I'm a kind of a core metals guy, and I think that you can be in those core metals and see wonderful things happening. And if you don't think that Shirley Bassey's onto it, then perhaps just Twain's more your mark. And it's, um, you know, I think the fact that uh, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. So I think it's rhyming very positively at the moment when it comes to... Um, to the outlook for commodities, but it's rhyming a little bit, unfortunately, perhaps in other areas. In 34 years, I have never seen more money available and in more flavours and colours than right now available to miners. Now, when the dust settled on the GFC, it was easy to laugh at low dock loans and ninja loans and step up loans and all these people. Who did they think they were? They could possibly repay, borrow that much money and repay, and how silly they were. They thought they were going to flip something in Florida. Are there parallels in mine finance right now? Is it new, is it different? Um, or is there just a lot of money around? Um, where is all this money coming from? All this money that was available at the moment in various forms, be it string, royalty, debt funds, they're probably the newest and most innovative players in the market at the moment. Um, well, meet Chuck. And all I can say is God bless America and God bless Chuck. Chuck lives in the flyover states. And millions like him, policemen, firemen, other people like that, risk their lives every day. But Chuck in particular, he runs into burning buildings every day. He risks his life. And he goes home at night and his wife says, why do you do it, darling? Why don't you be a fly fishing guide like you always want to be a work at the local hardware shop like your brother Bob? And he says, it's for the defined benefit pension, darling. That's why I run into burning buildings. Now, the problem is there's a bit of a fire going on in the offices of the company that manages the defined benefit pension for all of these hard-working flyover state Americans. The actuaries say they need about 8% and treasuries pay about 3 But that's all right because a nice young man with a mining debt fund has convinced them that he can deliver the balance that they need. So these pension funds that wouldn't have dreamed of investing in mining ventures. Mining ventures I think be, you'd be better to invest in right now than lend, where you might get a 10-bagger or a 50-bagger if you're very lucky, that they wouldn't invest in equity in these companies, would lend to them for maybe a 10 to 15% return if everything goes according to plan. Now, Chuck also needs that pension because he did a couple of bad property deals back in the GFC, which leads me to Olaf. Um, there's a chance that Chuck might end up like Olaf Margunson of Iceland. He did all his dough when his bank bought CDOs issued by Chuck's property financiers. 
And at this point, Shirley Bassey would be singing, and it's all just a little bit of history repeating. So there's a lot of money available, right? There's a lot of money available. So you've got your choice, but how you spend it will be what's important, or how the money the company you're invested in and spending will be important. The other place that lots of money is coming from is money chases momentum, right? Money chases momentum and money chases smart management. And that is true for mining companies. You know, you want to invest in good mining companies. You look for the smartest management team that you can. You make sure they have good assets. Smart management will always find their way to good assets. But then you also need momentum. And the chart that you're looking at there is the chart of Franco Nevada since Pierre Lasson, the great saviour of the Australian mining industry, he used to come here in the early 2000s and tell us to buck up. It would be 400 by Christmas. Um, James Morrison, who's sitting in the audience over there, I remember sitting in the audience in 2003 of Diggers and Dealers, and I said, Jesus, you know, they're all, it's, they're all suicidal here. If he's right, they should build a statue of him next to Paddy Hannon on the main street of Kalgoorlie. They never did, and I think that's terrible. Um, so Pierre Lasson refloated, and that's his share price in blue, all right? And that's the S&P TSX Global Gold Index at the same time. Pierre has left the gold miners in the dust. Now, Pierre, I have to say, is one of my just all-time heroes in, 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 in this market in terms of his analysis and assessment of the market. He saw at the lows how ridiculous the hedging was. Producers did. He bought Normandy, bought the hedging book back. He's the only guy that bought a hedging book back at a profit in all of the hedging books that were built back over the next 13 years, and they all thought they were pretending to be like Pierre. Now, right now, we've got a whole lot of people running royalty and streaming companies who are also pretending that they're just like Pierre. Um, some of them are pretty good, but in general, these guys are the benchmark. Now, the interesting thing here is Pierre has done incredibly well. He's seen the market very well. But I'm also going to suggest to you, and he is one of my heroes, and this is not a negative comment on him, this is just a fact of life, that his success is largely due to an interest rate bear, bear market. The lower interest rates go, the easier it is to discount future cash flows and pay more for them. And when mining companies were absolutely in the toilet because they'd borrowed a, an awful lot of money around here, and we're raising equity around here to repay it. And that's by the way, we're raising money here and not hedging because hedging was stupid. Watch the gold price fall, then started hedging and issuing equity here. They handed themselves sort of Pierre on a platter. And this difference, this is the value that mining companies handed here to the streaming and royalty companies. I mean, some of the deals that were done there were absolutely atrocious. There are some streaming and royalty deals that are done fabulously. The best one I've ever seen was when Perillia was a client of mine. Someone wandered in who thought they knew better and said, I'll give you $70 million for all the silver in the ground at Broken Hill. At the time, Perillia had a $70 million market capitalization. Clearly, the investors in Perillia didn't put a lot of value on the silver ground and Broken Hill. You can imagine how long the note was to the board and how long the board meeting went to say, yes, Mr. Dennis Wheel of Kirtle Lane, we accept your offer of $70 million for our silver reserve. When someone will give you a royalty or a stream on silver equivalent to your market cap for the metal you don't even talk about when you market to your investors, then that's a good deal. But most of the deals done down here, oh god, I've done it again, um, down here are not the same. So, so Franco has driven this, so they've raised the money. So these guys are raising money hand over fist. They have to start giving it out as well. So you've got Chuck throwing the money at the debt funds, Chuck's fund investing in here. They all have more money, they have to do it. The lending standards are definitely falling. That's okay if you're a borrower, as long as you don't fall too far for that. So let's go to where we actually are in terms of where all these sources of money are. And you feel me familiar with this. There's equity, there's quasi-equity, there's project finance banks, that's generally debt and hedging. There's funds, there's PE funds, there's debt funds, there's metal traders that want to get in on the act, and then there's the streamers and the royalty. There's, there's just plenty of choice. It's like a smorgasbord. And just like a smorgasbord, you have to be careful. You have to walk up and have to go healthy portion <laughs> control. Right? You just have to think about it that way. So, how are, they, how are they different? Well, convertible notes and equity convertibles, you kind of know about that. But the interesting thing is I break everything into life of loan and life of mine. Sorry, life of loan, life of mine, or life of all mines, all assets. Because every time you issue equity, it's a life of this mine and every other mine you're ever going to own. People uh, just dilute far too easily, in my view. They just don't see the long-term cost of capital. But equity has always been the case of that. Traditional project finance banks, well, people say that it's difficult. Well, you know, the bank money comes with more strings attached because banks generally want to get the money back. 
because it is their money, whereas a debt fund's are lending you someone else's money. So in a way, if they don't get the money back, it kind of doesn't matter as long as they must have made enough fees along the way. I mean, that sounds a bit cynical, but unfortunately it's true. Um, so bank is cheaper, you know, uh, sorry, the bank is not cheaper. Uh, there's more strings attached. At, you don't know until later whether it's cheaper or not when it comes to hedging, right? This is the problem. This is where hedging's kind of got a bad name because if the hedging's way out of the money, someone says, well, that was a very expensive deal. But you have to measure that against the, 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 the dilution avoided. If someone borrows money from a bank, does hedging, and that means they can issue less equity, then there's, the existing equity holders are holding on to a tighter amount. So that's, a, to my mind, a very important. The other thing, too, is the banks generate over here within two or three years, you've repaid them if they've done their numbers right, whereas, of course, a lot of these other things are life of, life of mine. You're still dealing with the stream, you know, your four management teams later on, and you're still paying that royalty to the fourth iteration of the management team at the royalty company. So, you know, that's, that's, that's an issue. Uh, funds, obviously, um, well, I'll just lend you more money. I mean, every time we look at this, we look at it, we look at a project, client comes to us, if a bank will lend them 80, the fund seems to know what the bank will lend them and says, well, I'll lend you 110. Bank says, oh, you'd have to do 150,000 hours of hedging on that 80. Fund says, oh, don't worry about that hedging stuff because they can't do it anyway. So now you've got a situation where someone's borrowed more money and has got less revenue certainty in the future. Uh, remember Chuck, poor old Chuck. Um, so that's... And then you've got the metal traders, and they're looking to do prepays and other things, and, and those can be very good. I, I saw a company, again, raise its entire market capitalisation by giving a life of mine offtake to a metal trader who liked the kind of uh, metal they were going to deliver. Now, every managing director of that company ever since hates that deal because he's got this life of mine offtake that he dealt with. But if he didn't have that, he'd have twice as much paper in the market on issue that he did by doing that deal. So again, please remember, it's the relative value of, of equity versus something that you're giving up, an equitable share of something to do with your project that's important. Streaming and royalties, I'm going to call them VPP from, from sort of this point on. Streaming and royalties are just volumet volumetric participations, price participations, and streaming and royalties are exactly the same. The only real difference between streaming and royalties is a bit like when you get divorced. If you, if you get divorced, and you just write a great big check and it's done, that, that's a kind of a, it's like a, like a royalty deal. Uh, whereas a streaming deal, it's kind of like you get some money now and you get some money later. It's kind of like an upfront payment to keep it quiet and then alimony for as long as you have to or the kids turn 18. But in this case, you're paying alimony. If you're the streamer, you're paying alimony until the kids are uh, uh, in, in close to retirement. So, you know, it, it, it's just different forms of the same thing. And if you morph them in from one end of the spectrum to the other, they're exactly the same. Um, the, the, the way they do the discounted models is, is exactly the same. We, we look at royalty and streaming deals for our clients, and they're both using exactly the same models. So just different um, flavours of the same thing. So when we... I'll just skip the animation here. This is what we do with our clients when we sit down. When we sit down and look at all the different offers that are available. In fact, before we look at the offers that are available, before we go out and talk to anyone, we sit down with the client and figure out, are they bankable? Is it even the time to go out and talk to the market? And what we tell them is we have to achieve the right balance. And I think the really interesting thing is that possible, the possible, that what we are able to do has never been more... Uh, there's never been more there, you know? At the bottom of that cycle, to be fair, some of those people who did those deals are now, say, make Pierre look very clever and them look quite silly, there were no alternatives. So that was the only thing that was possible at the time. That's not quite true. They could have done nothing. They could have sat on their hands and waited a bit longer. But most times, management companies say that's never the case because it'll be someone else. If I don't do something, somebody else will be managing this asset. So often the wrong things are done because people think they have to do something. When we get into this thing, we describe our clients, we say it's a bit like a triangular boxing ring, and we say, we're going to figure out where you want to be in this. What's possible? What do you want to do? But what would be required to do by those? Understand what their needs are. Understand what the enemy, and it is the case to some extent. I mean, at the end of the day, once you figure out who you want to go with, they're going to be your friend and your partner in business. But when you start this, it has to be competitive because if it isn't, you get your eyes taken out from day one. So we put our clients in the room. We figure out where we want to be, what's possible, what's required, what's desired. We drive a great big stake in the ground. We tie their foot to that stake. And every time the lenders drag them in a different thing by offering different bits of spice, we... we we just turn up with a ruler and measure the cost of compromise. And generally, you'll find that the clients, we leave them alone for a couple of weeks, and they're in one of the other two corners from where they wanted to start to be, and you start to reel them. I see the former banker in the audience smiling. Um, so the other thing we always say to our clients is this, because this is what Charlie Munger says to everyone before Warren Buffett ever invests any money. All I want to know is where I'm going to die so I know never to go there. That's very good advice. Um, 
That's how Warren Buffett got so rich, all right? Too many mining companies forget that lenders will lend even if they think you will die, but they will survive when you die because they'll sell the assets underneath from you. And as I said before, worse still, if they're making enough fees in the 10 or 15 years or the, in the five years until it's actually proven that you're going to die, that they don't care either because Chuck will take the hit and they will be up in the Hamptons, which is where they want to be really. Sad but true. So the corporate framework to determine the preferred alternatives, what, banking, what miners need to be looking at as an investor when you see them present, think, are they, have they answered these questions? Have they really thought about these things? Those points might seem obvious, but we just meet people all the time who say, oh, look, okay, I don't really need a debt advisor. I did one of these once before. Yeah, well, that's good, you know, once in 10 years, that's all right. We do three or four a year, but we may know a little bit more. But look, let's just sit and listen. Tell me what you think. Oh, the chairman wants me to talk to you. I really don't need your help. And then they say, well, we don't want to look at streaming. That's out. Or they say, oh, we don't want to do hedging. That's out. Or they say, often in West Perth, they go, oh, we don't want to talk to Macquarie Bank because they're too expensive. I say, OK, so let's, let's remove from the process the bank that has probably single-handedly brought more really successful junior mining companies into the mid-tier large space in Macquarie. Let's worry about what they make out of the deals rather than how successful their clients would be. But these are the kind of biases that people bring into the room. I do not want to do this. I do not want to do that. I do not want to do the other thing. We just say to them, well, why don't we start by not ruling anything out or anything in and actually look at what your circumstances are and to what extent they fit. And when it comes to streaming and royalties, the big thing for us is really that you need to compare them to equity rather than debt. You need to compare them like a joint venture partner in the project. And this is where the process tends to break down. And it's broken down for a couple of reasons. And one of them is the streamers and royalty guys who've got their own way for quite so long because the banks were so lame that they kind of tried to turn themselves into banks. And so the problem with some of the streaming and royalty deals that we have at the moment is they want to take full security. In the good old days, royalty guys would come in early. And my, my friend James Morrison, over here has a streaming company and did a very innovative little uh, royalty deal with Golf Illumina. Did a bauxite royalty, one of the first that I'd heard about on that particular um, commodity. And uh, the whole idea was that the company's share price was nowhere. They saw more value in bauxite. They were willing to take a future stream of the, of the bauxite. They gave the company the amount of money for a percentage of the bauxite that was much better than what the company could raise by giving a lot more equity away, a bit like those other deals described. The deal was done. That company got taken over by Metro. Metro happens to be a client of ours. Very happy and now producing. Now, that, they helped to bring that project on by taking a slightly innovative view. But they didn't in any way put um, things in that would stop a later developer of that project from borrowing money from the bank and bringing it to... What we've seen in some of these royalty and streaming deals, which is the problem, is they give some of the money that's required, but they want to take security controls that make it very difficult for companies to borrow later on or what they're doing. So streaming and royalty deals used to be happy to sort of be subordinate to banks, and then they kind of wanted to share security with banks, and now in some cases they take too much security, making it very difficult for people to get the deals done. And, and that, that's really been a bit of a, an obstacle. But, you know, if you look at those things, I mean, they've got to, you've got to understand why did they do that deal? What was the motivation? Was it because their equity is simply so low they don't want to raise equity and the bank would have them raise more equity than would be useful? Is, there an, is this only one of a lot of projects? I mean, I think a really good place for doing streaming is if you've got a multiple portfolio of assets and your share price only is essentially hanging off one one project, and you're getting no value. And how many times have you seen someone stand up here and say, we're getting no value in our current share price for those other four assets that we have? Then don't raise paper to fund this one asset. Stream that one asset, raise money against the value of that asset, minimise the dilution so that you're not essentially giving away 20 or 30% interest in all those other projects when you issue 20 or 30% of capital. The other thing um, that I, I, sorry, that I, I think is, is very important to, to say is that those people who say we don't want to do this and we don't want to do it and don't want the other thing, once you run them through the lessons, they decide what they want to do, they say, right, well, that's it, that's what we're going to do. And then they continue on that path regardless of whether their share price halves or doubles, the commodity price halves or doubles. You not only have to have an open mind going into the process, you have to keep an open mind during the process because it can take six to 18 months from start to finish to do a mine finance. And if the commodity price that you're, you're when you start, it's low, 
and you really don't want to hedge, you might talk to a debt fund. But if the commodity price goes up, if Aussie dollar gold goes from 1550 to 1800 in the time you're talking, you might say, well, geez, I'll just go down to Macquarie, do a much simpler loan, do a little bit of hedging, I can do that, and less dilution, I don't have the debt fund. You might have to pay the debt funds break free, but you should think about that. But what we tend to see is people, once they start on a path, they never think. So a bit like Keynes said, you know, the lady said to him, you've changed your mind. He said, well, madam, he said, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? It's the same here, external circumstances. So keep an open mind as you go through the process as well. Um, that's a table, and again, I encourage you, if you want it in more detail, get the slides off the website and have a look. That's a table we go through with our clients, so looking at what the alternatives are at different points. The interesting thing that we find during the negotiation, the gold price can go all over the place. The streaming and royalty guys actually don't change their metrics. Gold price can change by 100 bucks, and they don't change what they're offering you for share of the project. They're looking way out in the future. They've got a very different model. The bank, on the other hand, they will change, they will change their mind very quickly. If the gold price changes 50 bucks, the amount of money that they can lend you will change. Um, that's just, you know, it's just the nature of the model and the way they do things. So very, very important to, to understand that. Um, Key drivers in, in, in streams and royalties, just to talk about this, and I'm, 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 I am going to run out of time having rabbited on a bit on some of those points. As I said, a stream is a royalty paid in two parts. It's that simple. A royalty is a single amount of money. I mean, I think the main issue, again, to look at is where these guys can get into the sequence. That's the thing you need to understand. The Gulf Illumina thing, you know, way pre-production, it was actually to fund, I think, a feasibility study, James, is that right? Yeah, so you know, banks won't lend you money to fund a feasibility study, and a bank that will lend you money to fund a feasibility study, again, you might want to be a little bit wary about what the strings attached, but generally some kind of equity is what you should do to fund the project development, whether it's equity in the commodity itself or in the other thing. But the, the, the idea here is really, you know, these guys will come in early, and it seems less painless because you're giving away a percentage of your production. But in the time I have available, I might, if you look, forgive me, I'll just, just go through it. I'm going to, those are all on the website. I do want to show you this because I think this is very interesting. That's a distribution of all of the, um, the $8 exchange rates in the US dollar um, thing over the last five years. That's the percentage of time that gold was in that range at that Aussie dollar. And what's amazing is look at this. At 1448 Aussie dollars when gold was 1050 you got really bullish US dollar gold. It got all the way up to 1450 and bloody hell, the Aussie dollar gold price was still only 1450 That's the correlation between the Aussie and the, and the US playing out in spades. Now, what that means is that you can see one market go, one, but the Aussie, you've got to think about that in the context of your operating margin. And if you look at that, I saw a, can a company in Canada the other day, did a, um, it's quite unbelievable, uh, well, the whole financing is quite unbelievable, but in a part of it, they essentially gave away about a 6.5% net smell to royalty. Now, a 6.5% net smell to royalty expresses a percentage of the operating margin on a producer with 1,000 Australian dollars an ounce cost. Okay? Over the last five years, that, 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 it's only 6.5%. That's when, the, when, they, when they're selling you. They go, oh, it's only a 6.5% net smell to royalty. It's between 14.3% and 25% of your operating margin. And that's before you take into account the kind of the, the, the potential for oil prices to go up, wages to go up, or in fact, for the thousand to rise, and they're not contributing. So, so a net smelter royalty can, can, in that sense, can be very expensive. So you've got to be careful about big numbers if you're in a low margin business. And these are the kind of, again, the, the schematics that we go through our clients to help them. The other one which is interesting to look at is the impact of a, of a, of a, of a stream deal. If you did a stream deal where they take 20% of production and over life they give you a 25% payment of the spot price, that would be a pretty typical streaming deal. You, you want 100 million bucks on a gold mine, they go, okay, well, you know, we, we get 20% of the production and we only contribute 25% of the spot price in the future for that payment and we'll give you 80 million bucks up front. And that would be quite comparable to a, to a bank type financing. Well, the problem is that the formula that you work out on that the effective cost of production is you now produce 100% of the material, but you only get the economic benefit of 80% of that. So the operating costs are all yours. So your operating costs essentially go up by 25% because you've got to spend all the money and then all they give you back is 20% of 25% of the price, which is essentially 5%. So what you're looking at there is that as the price goes down, you essentially have an operating cost that goes up. So as the spot price goes down, your operating costs to produce are going up because your partner is not sharing equitably and they never approach what they were, your $1,000 before. Okay, so 
These, these are the long-term consequences that people need to think about that. So when you look at that and the consequence of companies talking about the alternatives, those type of things are, are important to, to consider also. Um, you know, there's a whole range of other things to look in. Tax is a very big thing. Um, you know, tax is a very big thing to, to consider when you're looking at streaming and royalties and different jurisdictions are quite different. We've looked at these deals in Africa and places like that and even country to country it can be different. If, in fact, the laws are written. We were looking at one deal and the client was determined they were going to do a streaming royalty deal and it wasn't actually clear what the taxation in the company would be. They took advice, but they were at risk on that advice. So, again, whereas the, the sort of project finance route is quite well, well known. So, um, I've got six seconds to go um, I um, I want to um, and again all these examples and I, I want to finish maybe there um, is, is it the new normal it's certainly not normal the position that we're in it's not normal in the sense there's more choice than ever been that could be good that could be bad I think that the the issue is really one of simply it's wonderful to be spoiled for choice it's really wonderful to be spoiled for choice. But one has to analyse all those different offers. And just because your next door neighbour who has a very similar project chooses one and they go down that path, they say, oh, well, we're doing a stream and everyone loved it, doesn't mean that you should do a stream because if you've got a different composition of shareholders, you've got a slightly different aspirations for your business or you've got a lot more diverse portfolio, what, what is good for them may not be good for you. So I think that's the important thing to understand is all you want to know is where you're going to die so you know never go there. And the easiest way to die is to borrow lots of money and have no revenue certainty. So that's to borrow lots of money without hedging. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to go broke. The other way to go broke is just to bring a mine into production with lenders that are very keen to start lending to you when really the best thing would be to sit and do nothing and wait till the economic cycle improves or you improve the underlying um, quality of your asset. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll say thank you. <laughs>